September 20th, and I would ask for a call to order. Okay. Dr. Spencer Rodman. Yes. Mr. Aquadro. Present. Dr. Jason Campbell. Present. And Mayor Fitzgerald. And like that, everybody stand for the point. to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. At this time I'm going to read the mission statement, Smith Vocational Agricultural High School is to prepare students for social responsibility employment, and post-secondary okay. education through rigorous, applied technical, and oh, academic yeah. programs. No, yeah. We have some guests in the audience tonight. I would just like to introduce group oh, no, and uh, introduce your group. Oh, I certainly will. Thank you. This is our Massachusetts State Greens master, Greg oh, Gibson, oh. his wife. Let's see, I have to do it in order. That's <laughs> okay. This is our lecturer, our program coordinator for the entire state. And her husband, Paul, uh, Ken Paulson. This is Kristen. Uh, we have two deputies here. This is Stephen Emerson and this is Tom Watson. In the back, we have another deputy, which is Ruth. Henry. Henry. <laughs> and in the back with a, another member coming up <laughs> is Roland Jaguer, who is the treasurer of our Connecticut Valley Pomona and membership chairman and myself. Excellent. Before I make the presentation, I have asked President Gibson to give you just a minutes who will report on what the bridge is because everybody's invited to the bridge. And he's come in from Maine <laughs> with us. Thank you for having us this evening. If you don't know what, or you haven't heard what the Grange is, um, the Grange was started in 1867. Um, it was basically brought together so farmers could take in, get together, find out a uh, better methods to advance their crops, basically go through the economics of what was happening at, at that time. In the 1870s, of course, with the crisis with the government, with the paper money, and the railroads increasing their fees, um, you know, it really helped at that point. So the Grange actually started as, as a, it was a lot of farmers that were getting together and starting up the Grange so they could meet and of course, as most people know, when the Grange first started, it was a secret organization. But the organization wasn't as the same as the Masons or the Eagles and stuff. The Grange is an organization that includes all of the family, from the kids to the grandparents, the husbands, the wives, female, males, it doesn't really matter. And every Grange person has a vote. And that has continued to this day. And back then, 
in order to keep the railroads and stuff from getting into the meetings and hearing about the discussions, they had a, they had an outer gate, an inner gate, and then a sign of salutation that you had to use. And so this was this was a good way for them to keep their secrets so they could advance their technology, advance their information, and, and proceed. As we advance now to today, our Grangers are involved in their community more. Their, our mission is to work with local farmers and advance agricultural education. And that is one of the reasons why our local Grangers had worked with our district Grange to get the grant that was, you know, allowed us to give you the, the money to help you with uh, restoring some of your tools and, and doing that. So it's a it's an honor and it's a privilege for us. Our agricultural committee was ecstatic when they heard about it, and Ruth and the local Grangers worked really hard to get this put through real kind of quick to make it make it happen. So again, thank you to all you guys. I mean, that's what puts us out there and makes us what we are. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. We're raising readers. <laughs> Rolling good catch. <laughs> Anyways, I have the check, and I included the application, which I wrote three times, <laughs> making sure all the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted. Um, I have an attachment to this school, because my father graduated in 1932, and the end gentleman in 1956, was it? Seven. Seven. No, Seven. No, no. And our son graduated in 92. There you go. So we have a strong connection. I would have graduated in 63 if my father said no. I went to Smith Academy instead. Anyways, can you come forward? Whoever is going to... Uh, let me see that. Everybody better smile. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, I included how I wrote it. I don't think I did before, but this is the what I wrote, and it was three pages. It was signed by a 1958 graduate, Linwood Clark. Who oh, is sure. It? Okay, you know Lynn. Yeah, My yeah. cousin. Oh, I said, sign it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this one here is the Board of Trustees, uh, yours, myself. Doug Caldwell is our Waitley Agriculture Commission. He said, oh yes, you tell me what you want. <laughs> and then the town of Waitley supported it also. So anyways, that's the check. We had to run it through our bank account so that we understand where the money is. But that's the $2,500. Thank you. What could be Other than Williamsburg and Hope Hadley, that oh, donated. That's all I'm aware of. Well, we can't thank you enough. Thank you so much. On behalf of the school, I want to thank everybody that's here tonight. Mm -hmm. I want to thank. This is a big contribution. Uh, we've got this. We had a meeting here at three o'clock this afternoon that we talked about putting together a budget for the repair of that building as well as replacement of tools. So there's a lot of due diligence going on. And we're going to spend this money wisely for the school and for the equipment. And I told Joe I'm not buying them lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Joe. Just give me an itemized thing of sure. what you spend it for because I have to report to. <laughs> you too? You got yeah. <laughs> Everybody No, has I'm joking. <laughs> thank you very much. And uh, uh, it's excellent. I'll give this These to my. These people came from so the much. eastern part of the state. And Central, Central? Yeah. Northern, yeah. Just so. Yes. <laughs> yes. I actually, you know, when Ruth had told me about it, my 
we have run a business in Maine, which I run for six months, and my son just got married this past weekend. So I actually loaded the trailer up with all the stuff to bring back to Massachusetts, and we drove back this morning. So we we're seven hours away to get here. But you know what? It's truly worth it. And like I said, you have a lot of local granges around here, and, right. and several of them actually work with the <coughs> doing fairs and stuff. So. This is what we're all about. So. And it was all downhill, right? All downhill. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I'll give me my business. Oh, that helps. I get my phone over here. Okay. And your card? Where's the money? Is it right down who you are? Yeah. 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 Thank you. you know, one other thing I, I, I have to say is when I heard of a fire and, you know, we talked about it, I had a fire in my garage and our facility because we have a we have a dairy, a distribution with a store, and I had a garage and everything that was there in 2013. And we had arson and it burnt to the ground. It was a four alarm fire, we lost everything by the time it was done. And stuff like this was what made us come back. And we have a new facility now. We run over 20 some odd trucks. Mm. We have a, we do, we do all over New England pretty much. But um, these, these types of gifts of, of what help us continue and go on. So this kind of meant a lot. So, uh -huh. I will mention the last thing is the grant that we gave the school was the largest award this year. I want to thank everybody personally. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. How's that? <laughs> I think I covered it. Right there you go. Now I'm official. Oh, very good. Excellent. Thank you for being here. Wow. Wow. I don't look that old, but our school's over 100 years old. <laughs> this guy is that old. Ruth, did you want to have a room to your roof pitch outside? Yes. Okay. That's the present. We should take the food picture outside. Yep. Okay. We'll just take your business outside. Yeah. Are we dismissed? Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> I can just take around if you want. Thank you again. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank I you. have three teachers in my family. <laughs> what? Yeah. This time we're going to have the participation by the trustee, Jewel. Thank you very much. Uh, three of us joined the board in January of this year, and we welcome a new member tonight. Since this is the first meeting of the school year, I wanted to take, take a minute to reflect back on the things, some of the things we've accomplished in our time together. We took the necessary steps to be able to meet in person starting in March, and our meetings are now recorded and posted on the Northampton Open Media YouTube channel. We're delighted to now have student representatives at our board meetings. Mr. Quadro and I attended the MASC Charting the Course seminars for new school committee members, and I went to the MASC learning lunches on superintendent evaluation and ESSER funding. Mr. Kaling, Mr. Quadro, and I all welcomed other members of the MASC Division 5 when they held their regional meeting here in this library. Mr. Kaley represented our board in a successful negotiation of the Unit D contract, and that was an important accomplishment. All three of us participated in the program advisory held last spring, and we hope that the mayor and Dr. Pearson Campbell will join us for this incredible example of mutually beneficial school community partnerships next month. We faced some challenges last May with the fire destroying the horticulture shop and instructional space and weather-related damages to D building. We're so grateful to the outpouring of community support for our school in the wake of these events, illustrated so beautifully tonight. 
and even more so to the incredible staff who stepped up in every way possible to support students and each other. It was a pleasure to be able to provide lunch to that, lunch at the end of that stressful week for the amazing adults who work here. We are also so appreciative of Mr. Quadro's expertise as a construction manager, which has been invaluable to the school in his role as chair of the property subcommittee as we decide how to move forward. I think we're all excited about the agreement we have with the city, shepherded by our mayor, to welcome the animal control facility to our campus. It's an example of how this school strives to serve our community while offering real-world vocational experiences to our students. And finally, I appreciate our board for meeting this summer at a retreat and look forward to together enacting our shared vision. Um, no, not at this time. Thank you. Ditto. <laughs> I'd Nicely like to done. just uh, report, and uh, we had a great property committee meeting earlier, which Andy will talk about. Uh, but I want to say that the congressman in the government's office has reached out to us about the damage that we had here with the fire. And I set up a meeting with his aide, <coughs> and he came in, and Andy, myself, Mr. Quadro, had an opportunity to explain exactly what funds we need, what we're trying to do, and. Uh, this gentleman was not just a head shaker and a, and a hand shaker and a back slapper. He really was concentrated on what our needs were, how we may be able to fix some things. And I just wanted to report out that our local congressman is in the loop, as well as Joe Comfort from the Senate. And um, we've got the House and Lindsay Sapodosa. So uh, I just want to let everybody know that when you go to vote, and you exercise that right, these people do listen, they do come, and they do participate. So I just want to share that as my report as a trustee. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to ask for the approve the minutes of the July 19th, 22 Board of Trustees. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Always beautifully done. The uh, school spotlight, we're going to table uh, for this meeting and bring it up at the next. So at this time, I'd like to go right to uh, Dr. Lincoln Horror and the new report. Business report, Mr. Campbell. Oh, she's there. I think Tim. Oh, Tim. Were you prepared to, to share Ms. Fairman's report? Yeah. Oh, excuse me. Come on up, Tim. Okay. She didn't have much. So. Um, she said in her packet she has the final uh, FY22 documents are in there, FY23 financial documents are there. Uh, she's working on the end of the year FY22, they're not due till next Thursday. And then um, the HR coordinator that resigned earlier this year, they're still working um, with Andy to get a replacement for a job description to get that built. Uh, she's been there working on procurement uh, 30B with the city financial officer for the capital skill grant for culinary, uh, writing the scope of work for the items. Hey, how's the land? Everything's great? Everything is great. Okay. Yeah. I, knew, I knew you had to bring your piece in there. You want me to? Sure. Okay. Did we skip past Andy's? Uh... <laughs> Sorry, you can go. Okay. I didn't want to take some understanding. Meeting adjourned. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I'm calling it the Apple storage. It's the storage buildings in front of um, automotive shop, um, Ag Mac and plumbing. Uh, it's the reinforcement of the flooring and the walls, all that project, the renovation project. It's going to get advertised tomorrow, and it's going to be a three-week process to get people enough time to come and really look at the job and the scope. Um, the companion annual building, which is the former rec building, the demo for that is pretty much done. Kids went down and took out all the electrical wires that we didn't need. Uh, I think we have a meeting tomorrow and where we're going to move the next step, um, lining everybody up for construction parts. Um, the windows for the project for this, win this winter got delivered a week ago. So we'll be work doing that, or they'll be doing that Christmas break, February and April break. Hopefully it'll be done. Um, the AC project for C building, I think we're in the final stage. We met with the engineer and the um, energy officer for the city just to make sure we're aligned with how they want to proceed on that because there's certain criteria the city really wants us to 
lock down on instead of just putting an AC system in that just kind of cool and not the most efficient version. So we what we've talked about a few options and I think we'll have some modifications, but hopefully that job will start probably February vacation and then April vacation. Hopefully we have to run <coughs> for that that last part of the school year. That's it. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Kevin. Subcommittee report. Okay. Um, as Mr. Kaling mentioned earlier, we had the uh, property subcommittee meeting today at 3 p.m. and uh, discussions about how we move forward with the fire, what we lost to the fire. And uh, we've established, um, well, backtrack a little bit, um, we hired Deets Architects for a feasibility study and helping us decide what we can, um, what can we do with what we can afford. So today we pretty much established what we could afford. And we feel we can afford a project of a tentative budget of $4.9 million, which will enable us to rebuild at least and expand some and to uh, bring it in more to the 21st century um, in terms of technology and uh, some wish list items hopefully. Um, the numbers are tight, construction prices have skyrocketed as you probably know if you pay any attention to the news. And uh, so we're right now targeted uh, Tuesday, October 18th to reconvene with the architect in the meantime, he will be fed information on our uh, our absolute needs and start developing uh, a concept. Uh, Dr. Lincoln Hooker, do you wish to add? Uh, it's actually in my report. I have a couple slides. I can okay. So we'll reinforce the support and elaborate a little bit more. So. Um, do you think I covered it all? Is there? Um, let's see. Yeah, we, we have, well, I think um, Dr. Andy will touch on the various grants we're, we're looking at and how we're going to come up with the funds. Thanks, Thanks. report. Good evening. <coughs> Welcome, Dr. Jason Campbell. Being here. So I know you can't read this. Uh, you'll see it in the printed report uh, when it comes to the minutes. But since we haven't met, for a couple months, uh, it's been July. Uh, you would think that the summer was downtime. It was very hectic. Uh, even though we weren't reinventing the wheel and dealing with the pandemic, uh, we still were very busy because we had a fire to deal with and we had a school year to prepare for and plan for and open up. So a lot of things were happening. Uh, but since the last last board meeting, um, July 22nd, uh, we've done a Minuteman and received the Skills Capital Grant uh, that we announced uh, for culinary arts. Uh, we were awarded several hundred thousand dollars for the culinary arts day program uh, for the school's capital grant. We also received the grant uh, to create a CTI program also in culinary arts and that's the Career Technical Institute program uh, really spearheaded by the governor. Uh, is how do we increase capacity, uh, vocational capacity within our schools after the school day ends. We have all of this equipment available to the community. How do we best serve the community after school hours? That's uh, the essence of the CTI program. So we received both of those grants back in late July. We are very busy uh, looking at how do we spend that money in a timely fashion. We have the deadlines, as Mr. Requadro said, uh, not only our building costs through the roof, the supply <coughs> chain is non-existent. Uh, so some of the key highlights that we have in that particular grant, just as a reminder, uh, basically totally revamping the kitchen, uh, creating an outdoor, hopefully an outdoor dining experience, uh, which will resemble what's happening in industry nowadays with outdoor dining. And another highlight would be a food truck uh, that we can showcase uh, for recruiting, marketing purposes, community outreach. Uh, so a lot of wonderful things will be happening through that skills capital grant uh, opportunity. There's a lot of MAVA related stuff going on. I'm not gonna get into the weeds around that, but several MAVA office meetings. Uh, we mentioned we had a property subcommittee back in July 26. Uh, first week of August, uh, several of the administrators, we were down at Devons for the annual MAVA planning retreat. Uh, there was an opportunity where we did recognize the governor and lieutenant governor. You were supporting MAVA? So, uh, 
all these acronyms. <laughs> so MAVA is the Massachusetts Association of Vocational Administrators. Uh, it is basically our professional association within the vocational world, uh, typically administrator driven. Uh, there's another one uh, you may hear at some point, they actually just changed the name, it's MVA, formerly known as MVA. Uh, they are changing the name to Mass CTE, uh, which aligns to ACTE, which is the National Association of, of Career Technical Education. That is a, the Mass CTE is the Massachusetts subordinate of ACTE. That's more teacher focused, but again, both uh, CTE, which is Career Technical Education uh, focused within the state. So when, when you hear MAMA, uh, it's basically our professional association. So I was down, uh, many of us were down the first week of August uh, with the planning retreat. We had the opportunity to celebrate and honor both Governor Baker and Lieutenant Governor uh, Polito with the Cronin Award, which is the highest award that we give out as MAMA, uh, as an association. What they have done single-handedly to drive the, the direction of vocational ed over the last several years has been incredible. And I keep hammering home the Skills Capital Grant. I will highlight it later in the report to showcase to the board how important the Skills Capital Grant is. To piggyback off of what Mr. Kalin was saying, uh, we can try to advocate to our politicians and potential incoming governors uh, how important that Skills Capital Grant initiative is. And you'll see in black and white why it's so important for us to continue uh, with our success. So we recognize both of them at that beginning of the tree. Uh, the following week, uh, internally, we had our leadership, uh, the administrative team, we had our planning retreat, uh, which sort of was on the heels of, uh, as Dr. Uh, Spencer Robinson mentioned, the Board of uh, Trustees retreat. We took all of that information, sort of the, the groundwork there. We built on that uh, with the, uh, the administrative team beginning part of August. And uh, it was a great, I think, kickoff to the school year, honestly. Uh, Mass hire me. Oh, yes. So I was contacted by by Mass Hire, Mass Hire has different centers throughout the state. We typically deal with the Franklin and Hampshire County Mass Hire, they're based out of Greenfield. Uh, this particular phone call included them, but it was also the Hamden County office as well. Uh, the Hamden County office has been uh, hosting an advanced manufacturing evening program down in various vocational schools down in Hamden County. Franklin and Hampshire County have also uh, hosted an advanced manufacturing evening program, typically at Franklin Tech. So that's the background. The problem that they were facing is all the, the vocational schools were drying up down in Hamden County. Uh, so the Hamden County office had money for the fall semester, but no place to teach the advanced manufacturing program. Lucky for us, their lead instructor is one of our day instructors. Uh, so it led to a conversation where why could we not uh, host that, that particular program here this fall? So we had some internal conversations. Uh, working with our adult ed program, and we are going to host their advanced manufacturing program here this fall, uh, which is a great segue to potentially, uh, we all agree, we all agreed that this most likely is a better location for the Franklin Hampshire County. Northampton, as we all know, is very easy to get to, compared to Franklin Tech, which is in Turner's Falls, I believe, so good luck getting to, to Franklin Tech. So this may turn into a long-term relationship, which would be great for uh, both Mass Iyer, but also for some education. You get more MAVA officer meetings. I'll get back to the school-based health center. I have an update on that, but we had some meetings throughout the summer around that. August 16th, we had another property subcommittee meeting, more MAVA. Uh, on August 18th, I went down back to Devons. The Department of Ed was sort of outlining and updating uh, the animal science, current state of affairs for animal science. And uh, there was a, a curriculum framework committee. Uh, two of our teachers were on that particular committee. And the big announcement was they're looking at pulling out vet assisting. Uh, as, as a reminder, animal science is sort of this large umbrella, many concentrations <coughs> underneath animal science. Vet assisting happens to be one of them. We know that many vocational schools have been approved to create their own standalone vet assisting program. It has caused some waves for us Aggies. Uh, so the state is actually pulling out the vet assisting from animal science. It's going to be its own standalone program. And uh, what does that look like? Uh, they discussed that on that particular day. As the Aggies, uh, we were told that uh, we will automatically begin given that new SIP code. The SIP code is basically like the serial number that identifies each of the Chapter 74 programs. We will be given that SIP code, so we will not only be offering animal science, but we'll also be offering the vet assisting. I asked some follow-up questions afterwards. Uh, it sounds like uh, 
I could, there is a vet assisting program most likely happening up at Franklin Tech. Uh, what would happen if a student wants to come here because we have the full animal science program, we have all the, the large animals as well. And what it's sounding like state, at the state level is students would still be allowed to come here to Smith because we offer the full animal science uh, where the other schools do not. So that, that's another advantage to Smith Book. So that was that update, uh, which is very important. That's been a couple of, couple of years in the, in the meeting. Uh, we have our bi-monthly bi DESI CTE update calls. We had one just yesterday. Uh, City Weeks Bradley. Uh, I know the board you received an email from you about the contract that's going around. Uh, this is some very important and much needed work here at Smith. So we are trying to contract with Sydney Weeks Bradley around equity training, and uh, there's been several conversations uh, starting back in the springtime, I believe, with Cindy. And uh, we've really focused uh, the vision of what our work wants, what we need from Cindy. And that focus is going to be on training of the leadership staff, myself as a superintendent and our leadership team. Uh, so we're going to have some mentoring opportunities for me. But we're going to have some meetings with our leadership team on uh, what does it mean to be a, a leader and an administrator and, and have sort of this open mind around equity and diversity. The other key component which I'm really excited about is this uh, sort of this equity audit, okay, looking at our policies, and I'll be working with the policy subcommittee, uh, going through the, the board policy manual uh, from that, that lens of equity. And uh, I mentioned this back in July when I came back from the MASS conference, that it really opened up my eyes that uh, you know, while we, I truly believe we may not be racist, okay, are we truly anti-racist? And many times as a, as a board, as a leader, we may create policy, we may create practice that we think is truly in the, in the best interest of all students, but is it truly in the best interest of all students? Are we, are we missing something? Uh, do we not have that correct lens on? Uh, so having this equity audit, I think, is going to be valuable uh, for here at Smith. So all that is in the contract. Uh, you may have noticed there's two board meetings. There's going to be two presentations to the board. Um, the board creates vision, and it's going to be very important for the board to, to buy into the vision, create the vision, and allow us as a school to, to right direction. So uh, we're excited to see that work uh, sort of unveiled in the next year plus. Then we really get into the beginning of the school year. So Wednesday the 24th we had our new staff orientation. Uh, this library is full. Now, oftentimes it's a bad thing when we have a large new staff orientation. It means a lot of people are running away. Uh, that wasn't necessarily the case here. As we know, and I want to thank the board for the funding support as we grow in student enrollment. There's been many areas where we had an increase uh, the staff, and uh, that was sort of the product uh, that we saw at the new staff orientation. And then Mr. Viac will expand more on that. So that was Wednesday the 24th. Following day, we welcomed back all of our staff for the staff convocation, a great kickoff. I'll be honest, it, it fought, it, I felt, in, felt empowered, I felt comfortable, I felt open that, wow, we can actually have a, a kickoff, sort of in some sense of normalcy. And it was nice to be back uh, together in person, not worrying necessarily about COVID as much and, and worrying more about teaching and learning. So that was a great, great day. That was Thursday. Friday, we had a new, a new student orientation, uh, which again, bringing in all of the freshmen and bringing in some new upperclassmen, uh, which is a great experience on that Friday. Came back after that weekend and we had the first day of school on Monday, the 29th. But that weekend wasn't downtime. Uh, that weekend, uh, we represented the school, we being the administrative team, up at the Cummington Fair, uh, which is an annual fair for us. Uh, if you haven't been to the Cummington Fair, you're missing out. Uh, definitely get yourself up there, and you will definitely be sort of entrenched in Smith Book Country. Um, it is just current student after current student, former student after former student. You heard that from the Grange. You know, a lot of alumni and, and, and children, of, you know, and so on and so forth, and you hear those stories on how wonderful this school is over the generations. Uh, it's a great opportunity. So. Uh, I enjoy my time up there. First day of school, I already mentioned uh, that Friday going into uh, Labor Day weekend, we have off contractually, we had that uh, non school day. But that's also the kickoff of the three county fair. So, just like the Cummington Fair, it's another great opportunity to get out into the community, showcase the school. Uh, I cannot thank the administrative team, all the staff that worked with that weekend. Uh, I, I think it was a great representation of the school. So, that was happening uh, Labor Day weekend. Labor Day, we had off. Uh, another nice bonus for the staff this year, uh, not only did they have a, a traditional four-day weekend, the Friday of Labor Day weekend, the nice long Labor Day weekend, but Tuesday happened to be primary election day, back to the elections. Um, 
And because we are a polling site, we closed for the day. So staff and students had a five-day meeting this year. We have more MAVA meetings. Now we get to our leadership meetings. So the capital assessment meeting, I'm going to touch on when we get into the horticulture piece. Uh, but part of the homework assignment that we had coming out of the previous property subcommittee was to have a meeting with the city talking about potential bond uh, opportunities. I'll expand more on that in a little while. Friday the 9th, we had the, the kickoff CBSR, that's the Connecticut Valley Superintendent Roundtable Luncheon uh, at the Delaney House. Commissioner O'Reilly was a guest speaker. Dr. Pearson, uh, you were in the audience. Uh, I could talk a lot about you know what the commissioner updated on, uh, updated the audience on, uh, but it was a well attended and uh, quite vocal crowd. Uh, I'll leave it at that. Then on the 12th, we had a faculty meeting, kickoff faculty meeting. Thank you, thank you to Mr. Bianca. Some mandated training that we uh, have to go through, uh, but again, a great meeting to kick, to kick the, the school year off. On the 13th, there was a skills capital grant webinar. This is the first time they've done such a thing. This is for the new skills capital grant that I will be <coughs> asking for uh, permission to apply this evening. It is so large that the state had this webinar to sort of talk about the do's and the don'ts and, and sort of the timeline and, and, and big topic items. So we had that webinar that we attended. On the 14th, uh, as MAVA president this year uh, and then one of our other officers, uh, we made a, a connection with the commissioner. We had, I'm calling it a coffee conversation in the North, in the north End of Boston last Wednesday the 14th and it was a two-hour meeting with the commissioner and one of the associate commissioners uh, in the vocational office and uh, it was quite frank it was professional it was very direct uh, in many ways uh, but a lot of concerns that we have as, as vocational administrators we were able to share with the commissioner uh, listen to the commissioner on some feedback I think it was worthwhile the promise walking away was that this was not a one, one and done I hope that we'll have monthly copies uh, I just learned that the traffic is awful driving to Boston. Okay? Uh, you know, what the GPS says when I'll arrive, it was 45 minutes later when I finally got there. So anyways, uh, it's all fun. Same afternoon, I got back, and I want to thank Nurse Gardner uh, for spearheading the annual flu clinic. Uh, it, it's wonderful to, be, to work in a school where at the end of the school day you can go in and get your flu shot. So it, it's a great experience, not experience getting a shot, but a great opportunity and benefit as a staff person to get that flu shot here in high school, high school grounds. Busy day, so after a coffee with the commissioner, getting my flu shot that evening, I spent with both uh, Mr. Kaylin and Mr. Quadro at the Arrival 5 uh, to kick off the school year, held this, this month down at the Academy of Music here in Northampton. Uh, so my first time on stage at the Academy of Music, or at least my last time on stage at the Academy of Music. It was great to, to rub elbows and, and network with individuals in the city and the area, so it was a nice opportunity. Another a leadership meeting, or DESE CTE update calls. We're getting almost to where we're at today. Um, we had a meeting this morning, the DESE meeting with the, with our admissions team and our admissions data. And I was a little concerned walking into this meeting. So the state is coming out with a grant where they were identifying vocational schools based on our initial admissions data that we had to submit last spring. So just for context, the data that we submitted last spring were current applications as of last spring. They weren't students that we've accepted and have started here. So we were in the midst of admissions. As a reminder, you know, admissions has been a hot topic in the state over the last few years. We've all had to update our admissions policies. There have been some vocational schools that were identified by the state that perhaps they had some gaps in certain demographic groups. And the state has been working with those individual schools on how to close those gaps. So. I was contacted by DESE to say, based on our initial admissions data, uh, we've been invited, I think is the term this one, right? We were invited to be part of this potential program. <coughs> so I got concerned as a superintendent that we were identified because of our data, which meant it was a bad thing, that perhaps there were some gaps in our, in our data, and, and we've been showcasing the data to the board on how wonderful we are doing with admissions. And in fact, how we are more diverse, our Northampton students are more diverse here than they are at Northampton High. So, it's something that we really want to hang our hat on and celebrate. So I was concerned that I was identified as a school that maybe would want to be part of this program. Uh, my concerns were laid to rest today. Um, it was not because of any gaps in our data. We were identified because in the applicant pool, we actually have an increase in applicants from students who are low income, special ed, or ELL. Uh, so we have an increase in those applicants, which I think is a good thing. Um, 
because of that, the state has identified us for this potential grant that we are going to look into. And uh, the grant, the grant's focus is not around admissions. It's not around recruiting students. It's once those students arrive to Smith, are we best prepared and do we have the support systems in place to educate those particular demographics to the best of our ability? Uh, so that's the focus of the grant. So we're going to be looking into that. There's a kickoff later this week. So I went from losing sleep to, okay, we're doing a good job and, and this might be a good thing. So uh, I want to thank Rebecca and Joe there this morning for that particular call. As we mentioned, we had a property subcommittee this afternoon looking forward to momentarily. I know you can't see this. A couple of pictures. Um, this one, front sign. How many years have we talked about a front sign here as the Board of Trustees? And we tried every which way uh, to fund a front sign. Uh, but we got a front sign finally this summer, uh, which is great. I think it's going to be a wonderful communication tool for the community. Uh, so we're very proud of that front sign. These other two pictures, again, I, I know it's kind of hard to see in, in, in the peanut gallery, but this is finally post-demolition of the horticulture building, the fire-damaged aspect of the building. Uh, this is sort of more of a, a wide-angle view. We have our slab remaining, which was our former garage. That was the site of the actual fire. And then a little bit closer, and you may see some fencing material. Okay, That was Mr. Ron Spock's former classroom. Okay, And we'll talk about that momentarily. And this exterior wall, you can't see, there's a, a chalkboard on that wall. So that used to be an interior wall of Mr. Osbach's classroom. It's now an exterior wall to the building. Chalkboard is still on the wall. It's still wishing Mr. Osbach a happy birthday if you want to, if you want to see it drive down that. Uh, but we'll talk about that outdoor space and what that may look like uh, as we start you know, brainstorming ideas for the building. But it looks a lot better. Uh, at least we don't have the fire damage still standing there. Uh, it's now safer for the students in the community. Now we can begin to think about next steps. So, just a quick trip around the campus. So can I ask a question? Yes. Um, first, to say how much I, uh, a busy summer for you, yes. and uh, we're so appreciative of your advocacy for the school in so many um, different corners of the, of the city. Really, really wonderful. Um, and what good news about that, uh, yes. the potential grant with regard to admissions and a reflection. I think of the reputation that the school has in the, in the larger community, for sure, of, of serving those students so well. Um, I have a question about the, um, the, the webinar on the Capitol Steel yes. Screen. You said the grant is so big that they need to have a webinar on it. Why is it so big? Um, like, is it? Monetarily, yeah. it's potential of $5 million. Uh, I've never seen a $5 million grant awarded through this school, but the uh, skills capital grant program, and knowing that 70% of that grant could be applied to improvements, <coughs> so it'd be some type of building project, uh, the state realizes because it's a reimbursable grant, we are spending this money looking to be reimbursed. The state wants to be on top of that cash flow, so they know that most likely we don't have five million dollars kicking around to go out and spend all the five million dollars to get reimbursed. So they're going to have very, very concrete timelines. Uh, to check in what almost like weekly or bi weekly meetings with the state if we receive this award. To say, okay, where are we in the timeline? Where are the invoices? Where is the reimbursements? So we can hopefully stay afloat with such a building project. So it's just much larger. Do you know what, can, what the conditions were that created this opportunity? I think the state has some potential revenue and we're not quite sure how to spend it. I think the governor, back to the governor being recognized, and I said this when I saw him in August, thank you, Governor. Because of him and Skills Capital Grant, we're still in business. Uh, I think he was, he knew he's on his way out. This is one last chance to support vocational lead across the Commonwealth. And we've also, we being vocational lead, have been complaining about capacity issues. We have these wait lists, we all hear about wait lists. And our answer is, if I could take all 300 applications, I'd take them. Then why would we want to deny a student a vocational education? Um, but we don't have 300 slots every single year. I just, we can't educate that many students. Give us more space, we'll teach more students. Uh, so I think that message has been sinking in a little bit. And uh, knowing that our, our facilities are aging across the Commonwealth, we know how difficult MSBA can be. I think this was the governor's vision of what can they do on a smaller scale, short of an MSBA major project, to support vocational ed. So that, I'm speculating about it. Thank you. It makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So talking about the horticulture building, uh, Mr. Aguadro really, I think, 
summarized today's meeting really well. The finance is just a kind of overview for the full board where we are financially. Uh, the initial insurance settlement offer that we received is in the ballpark of $900,000. That doesn't come close to rebuilding what we lost uh, you know, with the current construction costs and whatnot. And that 900000 includes everything. That includes the demolition that we had to you know, knock, knock the building down. That includes the architecture for, uh, fees, so on and so forth. So my point is there's fees and, and costs already associated with this rebuild before we even get to the rebuild that goes into that 900000 So what we were talking about as a subcommittee, we can't bank on the full 900000 towards the overall building budget because we're already spending some of that already to get to this point. The first grant we've talked about uh, endlessly over the summer uh, is this first skills capital grant. Uh, we were able to apply upwards of 30%, 30% but the total was like two and a half million, somewhere in that ballpark <coughs> that we could apply for it as a total grant. 30% of that grant could be applied towards capital improvements. Uh, I've been invited as Bob a president. Uh, the announcement's gonna be happening next Tuesday. Uh, so hopefully some good news will be shared after next Tuesday. Um, and hypothetically, if we receive this grant, $600,000 of that grant, uh, we've earmarked towards capital improvements. Now, talking to the subcommittee earlier today, technically if you read the grant application, that $600,000 of capital is being applied to the animal science renovations. Tim was talking about the, uh, in the animal science building, the former GCC building. Uh, all of those renovations, we're looking at the pig barn, we're looking at the MS barn. Before the fire, I was prepared as superintendent to stand in front of you as a full board and ask for money from tuition revolving to cover the cost of these renovations because we wanted to expand animal science. That's been our vision all along. All of a sudden we have a fire. So when I was talking to the state about how do we apply for this particular grant, uh, it, in essence, it's a shell game. So what we want to do here, if we receive this grant, that grant will be directly tied to the renovations of animal science. But then that means I can hopefully stand in front of all of you and you will support me to say rather than taking that money out of tuition revolving for animal science, we have the grant covering animal science. So now can we take the money out of tuition revolving and put it towards the building project? Okay, that makes sense. So it's literally a shell. Uh, so that's the current grant that we've submitted. We will find out next Tuesday officially. A larger grant that we're going to talk about a little bit later on the agenda uh, to, to give us permission to apply uh, is much larger. We're talking two and a half to five million dollars. The great thing about this particular grant is 70% of that grant can be applied to capital improvements. So if we are able to submit a grant on the scale of five million dollars, that means three and a half million can be towards uh, capital improvements, such as three and a half million towards a horticulture rebuild. The other 1.5 million would have to be in equipment. The other key change in this one, we can apply for up to four programs. Because the challenge, and I share this with the state, uh, the challenge is if we receive this first grant, we get to find a lot of equipment to, to make up that first grant. If we receive that first grant, what else can we ask for? Uh, to come up to, to 1.5 million. The state said, Andy, great point, great question. Uh, but just remember, you can apply for up to four programs. So if given permission tonight, uh, we are prepared to look at horticulture, obviously. We are looking at ag mechanics for the welding program. We are looking at cabinet making, and we are looking at advanced manufacturing. Those would be the four programs. Why those four? Every skills capital grant, they come out with a list of uh, sort of priority industries, priority shops, that if you're able to apply for a grant that meets, that's on that list, you rise to the top of the list. So if you look at the list, we notice that those four shops are on the list, and uh, so it increases our odds. Uh, so, fingers crossed. You get five million, you can get three and a half of that towards capital improvement, which means horticulture building. Monetary donations, this does not include uh, you know, the wonderful uh, grant from the Grange, but as of this morning, including gift cards, so again, we can't apply all of this to the building project, but between monetary donations and gift cards, we're looking at $38,569.37 we have received from the community, uh, which is great. Okay, so that will help us with tools, equipment, potential building project. Uh, so that's a, another great highlight, I think, to showcase the, the interest and the support that we have. <coughs> so you add all of that up, and we're looking at that 4.9 million range, which is, as Mr. Quadro said, as a subcommittee, you know, we feel comfortable saying, you know, let's look at a building project, uh, renovation, rebuild, uh, 
that's in the, the ballpark of 4.9 million. A couple of other tidbits. Uh, we were charged with some, doing some due diligence around some other funding sources. I just want to share this with the board. So Ms. Fairman and I met with the city, uh, so the mayor and the finance director, and, uh, and talked about what would it look like for the city to take out a bond for this particular building project. And uh, there was a great conversation, very professional. Uh, the big takeaway was uh, the city was going to be in, would be interested in having that bond if their yearly assessment for that bond can be counted towards net school study. <coughs> for those in the community, out, out in the public, uh, what does that mean? Okay, uh, the state has a, a regulation on the books that caps uh, how much money, capital improvement, capital expense money can be applied to net school spending. And the theory behind that is uh, the community that builds a brand new school. Obviously, there's a bond uh, involved in paying for such a school. If all of that money being applied to pay off the bond uh, went towards net school spending, there would be no more money left for the operating budget to teach the kids who are in that school. Uh, so the state has a regulation that says uh, any projects, capital projects, up to $150,000 a year can be applied towards net school spending. Above and beyond that, it cannot count towards net school spending. So that's the regulation uh, that's being discussed. Talking to the city, they wanted us to ask the state if they would waive that regulation. <coughs> so allow the entire bond assessment from the city to count towards that school study. That would be a concern, obviously. Uh, the second concern would be uh, other capital improvement projects that we have funded by the city most likely would be off the table. Tim talked about the window project. We've done buses in the past, sidewalk project, AC. There's been other projects, boilers, when the boilers break, the city has been able to help us out with capital improvement. If we had this particular deal, all of that would be off the table. So Crystal and I, based on that meeting, we had to talk to the state to see if the state would even be receptive to such a waiver. So we met last week, and uh, the state said, no, okay, we're not going to give you a waiver. So that is off the table. That, that will not happen. What the state did talk about, and I have it on this slide, uh, is why aren't we pursuing the non-resident capital assessment? That's a regulation uh, out there. Uh, it's on the books because of Minuteman down in Lexington. Well, and when they built the new Minuteman, they had a large percentage of non-resident students coming from Boston. The member districts felt it was unfair that the member districts were paying for the new Minuteman, and the city of Boston was off the hook. Uh, so they created this non-resident capital assessment regulation. Basically, take that bond, take that yearly assessment, um, divide it amongst the non-resident students. You get like a per pupil cost, and that per pupil cost, that per pupil assessment is set as a bill on top of the non-resident tuition to the city districts. <clears throat> that is out there. We could pursue that. Um, I, I shared with the property subcommittee this morning. There's a larger elephant in the room called D building. At some point, we may want to deal with the D building at some point. That could be a much larger project down the road. That regulation, I think, has to be talked about now. <coughs> the challenge here in the, in the current political climate, in the current budget climate, Dr. Pearson Campbell heard it okay, at the luncheon, okay, some concerns about money and concerns about how do we deal with a budget, a very tight budget in very small towns. Many towns are already upset with us because of the non-resident tuition rate. If we are then to apply a capital assessment on top of that bill, we would lose a lot of friends uh, in the region. And I would worry about student enrollment. They would find other ways to, to offer education to their kids. So our enrollment could potentially drop. And ethically, my, my other dilemma I would have in advocating for this, we're talking about one Chapter 74 program. We're talking about horticulture for this one building. Many towns send many students here, and some of those towns have no students in building a horticulture building. But they would be assessed this non-resident uh, assessment. So is that really fair for those towns to be paying for a building where they have no kids in the building? program. So uh, for many reasons, that's why I, I recommended to the property sub subcommittee not to pursue uh, using that option. You're really looking at insurance, those two school capital grants, and any other opportunities that we have, as Mr. Kaylan mentioned and Mr. Quadro mentioned. Uh, so that's where we're, we're comfortable as a property subcommittee at that 4.9 million range at this point. So we can move forward. Uh, we know we're, we're pushing October. We want to have a building as quickly as possible, but we want to do it the right way. And, uh, and make sure we're not missing anything. So, if I'm missing anything, those questions? It's a lot. I mentioned the school based health center. I received a phone call a 
couple weeks ago from Eliza, who's the executive director of the Hilltown Health Network. You can tell she was stressed. The uh, Hilltown Health Network uh, is up against uh, many upgrade, facility upgrade issues that they're having in some of their, in their satellite uh, locations. They also know that we're up against it with the whole culture rebuild. And uh, Eliza asked if I was okay uh, if they asked the state to have an extension on the grant that was helping fund the equipment for the school-based health center. I said I 1,000% an extension. I think it would make all of our lives a little bit easier. That doesn't mean that we're opposed to the, the program and to the project. We're totally, totally supportive of the project. We just felt more time would be worthwhile for both the Hilltown Health Network who's doing all the, leg, the legwork, and obviously in our current state of affairs, gives us more time. Eliza went as far to say if the state says no, we're not going to give you an extension. <coughs> She's fine with that, and she will reapply for the grant when the time is right. So uh, just letting the board know that we're sort of hitting the pause button, but not the stop button, if that makes any sense. Uh, so we'll revisit when, when they're ready. Tim alluded to this. Uh, this is what Crystal's working on. Uh, the procurement procedures review and updates. So as part of the ESSER grant program, uh, I will say several, I don't have a number, several school districts were, were notified. Uh, as part of the ESSER program, uh, they were, review, were reviewing procurement procedures in all of the districts. And there were some updates that have to happen in many districts. Uh, we were happy to be one of the many. So Crystal is working diligently around the clock on and reviewing our current practices and procedures. There will be a, a draft presented to the board next month uh, to review and approve. So uh, really nothing earth shattering, uh, but I just want you to be aware that there will be something in front of you next month for that. <clears throat> Perkins. So in light of Essers and, and, uh, and our hope as a school administrative team, a school community, a board of trustees, we talked about how we spend the Esser money, was it back in the springtime, and just trying to be as transparent as possible so people know where those funds are going. We felt it was worthwhile doing the same thing for Perkins. So we talk about Perkins every year. Uh, it's a federal money that, that supports vocational ed. It's uh, dispersed by the state, by each state. This year we received $100,000 for this school year. Uh, I, I just want the board to be aware of where this money goes. Uh, back up a second. Okay, over the summer, the state had some available money, leftover money from the previous year. They were trying to figure out how to spend that money. They came to MAVA asking us. They wanted to offer money for basically summer enrichment programs, uh, summer school type of programs as well. And the superintendents were like, you know, thanks. Okay, but we're okay right now with some money trying to figure out academic support. What we really need is some more money for equipment. So the state accepted that. They issued some smaller focused Perkins money over the summer. We received $39,610 over the summer. Again, this year's school allocation was 100466 So how do we spend that $100,000? I want to thank Joe for creating this model uh, because we found over the previous years a lot of our staff, they don't work over the summer. So how do we get requests from the department so we know what to write for uh, when Ms. Shari is running for the Perkins in, in August? So a request goes out to all the shops. If you're interested, if you have any needs, please submit this form, your rationale and justification for this equipment professional development, whatever you want through Perkins. All of those requests come to the admin team, and now we have that on file. So then we can review those, those requests in August and figure out how we're gonna uh, apply for the Perkins. But it also helps us as different grant situations come up. So when that summer money came available, that was such last minute, we needed to get those requests in. We were able to go back to the file, pull out those requests and say, hey, you know, such and such a department was asking for something, we couldn't fund that in last year's Perkins. We haven't bought it yet. Let's put it through. So that request process is very beneficial. So we have 15 programs, as we know, 15 uh, shops. 13 of the programs received some kind of funding this year, uh, which I think is very equitable. <coughs> Why did we not give the money to those other two programs? They were the two programs that asked for nothing. <coughs> so you don't ask, you don't get. Um, so just the, so the board knows. Okay. This is where I want to hammer home the impact of skills capital grants. Okay, so I pulled out some non-equipment uh, categories. I, I lumped together teacher PD, admin PD, curriculum writing, the fair representation. So when you went to the three county fair and you saw the teachers working there, they were getting paid. I want to thank the board and, uh, for allowing us to, to actually pay the teachers. Uh, when I first came here, it was totally voluntary. 
uh, to get teachers to volunteer on a holiday week when it's next door possible. So now we actually give them a stipend to work there. That comes out of Perkins. Uh, committee work. So there's a lot of committee work that Joe oversees uh, that we, we pay stipends to those teachers. That totals about $42,500, okay? Add in student organization memberships. So I know in our operating budget we support FFA and skills, but the actual student memberships into both of, both of those organizations we cover as a school through Perkins. That's $4,300. And in recruiting, okay, uh, I told this to the commissioner the other day that I get a bad rap from sending superintendents who make fun of me to say, Andy, I wish I had a recruiting budget like you do. And my response always is, I wish I didn't have to have a recruiting budget like we have. Uh, but that's another topic for another day. Um, this year's Perkins, $6,600, and that is to redo all of our banners and, and other recruiting uh, material that we have. If you add all of that up, that is at least half, if not over half of our Perkins is allocated to non-equipment. That means we only have approximately $50,000 this year to spend on actual equipment. One piece, one new CNC lathe or mill in the advanced manufacturing shop, Tim, would cost us, what, a couple hundred thousand? Okay. There's no way we could survive as a vocational school simply on Perkins. Because we have to focus on the improvement of our teachers and our staff, which is why we have PD. We have to focus on the student organizations and make sure that they're involved, and we have to focus on recruiting. So by focusing on improving our staff, we have no money left over at Perkins, which is supposed to be upgrading our, our technology and our, our equipment in the jobs. There's just no way mathematically for us to sustain that, which is why the Skills Capital Grant Program is so essential. Questions on Perkins this year? So that $1.5 million that we could potentially get out of this big grant, uh, that's what saves us. Uh, so. Donations, almost done. So we've received four donations over the past month, one for uh, advanced manufacturing, we received a new monitor to replace a broken monitor, and that's coming to us from Mill 180. In our graphics department, we received 10 cases of paper from Brockway Smith. Culinary is receiving uh, various springform cheesecake pans uh, from Trish Armstrong. And finally, Mike Florio is donating a non-working Wee Whacker and Leaf Blower. Sounds exciting, but we're going to take those motors out allow the freshmen to use them to tear down and rebuild in the AgMEC program. So thank you to all the donors, wonderful donations. You can't read it, but if you read the Gazette, you'll see we've been in the news several times over the last couple of months. Uh, this one, I, I, I love the look back. Thank you to Ms. Carver, my researcher. A hundred years ago, okay, talking about we were actually in existence a hundred years ago, uh, a group of, uh, where is it here? Okay. A group of Smith School teachers uh, hiked up Mount, uh, where was it here? So now it's cut off. But they, they hiked up a mountain. There was a beautiful view. Okay. It's quite uh, a hike. What's that? It was quite a hike. It was quite a hike. It was from the description. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so it's fascinating. So that made it. <coughs> the middle article is talking about the football program kicking off the, the season. And on the right, uh, again, highlighting our new billboard, the front sign that we talked about a little while ago. So uh, it's wonderful to be in the paper with, with some good things. <clears throat> Looking ahead quickly, tomorrow morning, reminder, uh, a general our first general advisory committee meeting. Those are the chairs of each of our program advisories. We'll be meeting tomorrow morning. Uh, tomorrow afternoon, uh, there's a lot of projects going on. So we are uh, pulling together the Animal Science Renovation Committee. We're going to be talking about mapping out the renovations for the animal science building, the pig barn, MS barn, so on and so forth. So we'll be the meeting of the minds tomorrow afternoon. There's a leadership meeting Thursday night, back to school night. Uh, so Dr. Pearson Campbell, back to school night is what we call open house. Well, you would call open house, we call it back to school night. Uh, we do have an open house that's later in the fall. That's where we do marketing. We bring families looking at the school as an option. So back to school night on Thursday. We have uh, on Friday, we are recreating the district leadership team, that would be myself, uh, Mr. Bianca, Ms. Wanzik, uh, and Ms. Fairman, uh, will be meeting Friday mornings. That same day I have the CES steering committee meeting. Uh, that's online, but that's the CES again is based out of Northampton. Next week, uh, as I already mentioned, I'll be uh, at Westville Tech for the Skills Capital Grant Announcement Ceremony. We have a board of MAVA stuff going on, leadership, so on and so forth, anything else. As a reminder, 
Monday, October 10th, no school. That's uh, Columbus Day, Indigenous Day. Uh, so no school on October 10th. As I already mentioned, as another reminder for the board, I think it's on your agenda October 12th. I think it's Wednesday of that same week is the program advisory meetings. It's that night. That's where all 15 shops they meet with their advisories. You know, we're able to walk around and check in and say hi. Uh, a wonderful evening. Anything else exciting? As Mr. Quadro already said, we have our next property subcommittee meeting, which is at 3 o'clock the same day as our next board meeting, which is the 18th of October. So we have all elections coming up again? For we do. That's in November. November. Uh, Ten. Yeah. Correct. Okay. So I only got us to the next board meeting. We'll talk about that next week. Very week. Good. Yes. I have... Um, Three comments and one, one question. I was reflecting on your whole presentation. Like super informative and really appreciate it. feels like um, we're able to keep our finger on the pulse of what's happening at, at school um, in this district, but also at, outside of it as well, you know, in the larger world. Um, I, um, I'm disappointed that um, you were asked to request a waiver um, to that regulation. Um, of, you know, limiting net school spending being spent on capital improvements. It exists for a reason, and if it, if the waiver were granted, we'd be in a bind. You know, so I'm I'm, I'm disappointed. I, I I guess I I understand as a taxpayer in the city possibly why that request was made, but it still I'm not happy about it. Um, the the all, the other option of um, adding the assess you know adding a fee a, like assessing a fee of attending districts to the students um, just want to reiterate I, I want to do whatever I can to advocate for our rural districts which are just struggling um, for so many reasons due to declining enrollment more more than anything else but also the you know of course their tax base um, not only do they have to pay the non-resident tuition but they also have to pay the transportation costs. Um, I, I, I would welcome any opportunity that we have as a board to advocate for those districts so that they it, it isn't it isn't so difficult for them to you know send their students here. Um, I'm also very disappointed that the health center that is in Hoslin. I'm so excited again because of so many sending districts that students would be able to receive their health care here on campus. Is, Fabulous. Um, so I, I hope it is a cause for and I hope that for maybe maybe an extension will be granted. That will be fabulous. And if not, I, you know, just really encourage that. It's able to happen. Um, and my question is, um, we, we don't have a grant writer yet, even though we budgeted for that position. And this is the largest grant we've ever seen. Who's writing the application? Mr. Bianca Michardi. Thank you. That's a lot of work. Uh, the grant writer, I can respond a little bit on the grant writer. Uh, I know Tim mentioned the HR coordinator that we're working through the job description. I really <coughs> challenge and charge the, the administrative team to look at this is our opportunity. You know, anytime, I think any school district, any organization, when there's a resignation, a retirement, whatever, it's a chance for us to look in the mirror and say, how do we want to move forward? Uh, specifically with the grant writer, we've had very few applicants. In those were either overqualified or underqualified, or potential conflict of interest. There were other issues that, that Ms. Fairman, I think, accurately addressed with potential concerns, which led to an opportunity as part of the discussion. The challenge has been it's a part time position that we post in court and it's been funded. The adult ed is also looking for some support. Lorena is <coughs> doing an unbelievable job in the evening building our program to the point where she needs some support as well. And uh, actually, I give credit to Lorena for even bringing this up as an idea. Of why aren't we looking to combine both into a potential full-time position that would serve both needs? Uh, and would a full-time position attract more qualified candidates? So that's what we're looking at right now. Uh, so I, I really applaud the outside-the-box thinking. Uh, I support Crystal, and she wants the right person. Uh, I think it's very important. So that's, those are the discussions. So again, it's not a back burner without thinking about it. It's how can we get the best person. So. But the After Dark Culinary Program, that will also be under the readiness. Yeah, right. So coordinating. Yeah. In that position, that grant allows us to have part of the grant can be applied to administrative sort of oversight, uh, which provides, again, a funding source for potential support. Is it a one-year grant? 
two-year. Two year. Okay. Other questions, comments? I think it just as a, a preview. Okay, I was going to share this evening, but I felt more time. I want to talk to the, the administrative team. But, uh, next month, you're going to be entertained by uh, a presentation around my goals and the evaluation process. So stay tuned on that. Okay. And you know who I am. So I'll turn it back to the chair. Thank you. Joe, you're going to have your lady report. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Bailey. Uh, just a little bit of background for uh, Dr. Pearson Campbell. About six years ago, we started having student reps at the Board of Trustees meetings to be able to report out. Uh, that went away in COVID. Uh, and then when we got back in full person, the board wanted to make sure that that started up again. So Mandy is actually our fourth uh, student rep to the board. We generally do a process where we have a senior and a junior. When the senior ages out, graduates, we backfill with another junior. So we sort of create this mentor-mentee relationship. So. Um, I'll turn over to Mandy for the start of, of our report time. Okay. <coughs> um, for the report, we have some things from the library. The library is hosting a uh, library of education for the ninth grade class, as well as research classes, both in the 12th grade and criminal justice. Um, Ms. Skip Hodgson has been hired as the new social media coordinator. And from the automotive shop, uh, we'd like to welcome Joe Lamana. Uh, Joe comes from the field with 25 plus years of experience from Florida and Northampton. Um, and with that, Steve put a bit high in the same department head after the retirement of Al Bodman. Um, the department is <coughs> excited for the direction or uh, the instructor, instructors are moving with the program. There's a lot of emphasis on exploratory and professional theater and like curriculum options for the program. And we have a lot of fundraisers as well this year. Um, this month, uh, volleyball, they're having a 28 day donation campaign for team activities and manual clothing. Culinary arts as well for shop field trips, transportation clothing. JWOP on the primary day, primary election day, they had a big sale for the uh, people who came in to use the voting pool. And then FFA had their annual cookie day sale to help with FFA membership and activities costs to the government. Uh, they're selling the uh, Smith swag at back to school night to help with campus wide and student go sponsored activities costs. And the girls soccer is at the shoot a thon fundraiser for team activities, equipment and clothing as well. And then Google does is having a car wash as well as a cookie donut sale. Thank you, Mandy. We're actually going to do a little show and tell here at the, at the end of my report. <clears throat> uh, just to give a current enrollment update, uh, so we are currently sit at 567 students, 115 of them from Northampton, 20.3%. Uh, you can see our numbers in 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th grade uh, as we continue to march towards the goal of 600 students back on campus. Um, so we're at 151 ninth graders, 150 10th, 136 11th graders, and 130 12th graders. Um, Dr. Spencer Robinson asked about attendance rates. Uh, so I do want to say this with the caveat of this is a student student attendance rates. Um, and this counts all absences. So this is how many students were here. It's not broken out <clears throat> if there was excused absences, other absences. Um, at Smith, we do excuse a lot of things if it has to do directly back with their shop areas. Um, and so now is a time of year when we actually see a lot with the fairs where we have a lot of our agriculture students are competing through 4-H uh, or their personal farms or other things that they're, they're at the fairs. And currently, we, we had a group over the weekend that we'll be happy to report out results at the next board meeting when we get official, official results that they were at, at the Big E. Um, but currently, our rate right now is 95.17%. I went back through the two years uh, when we were dealing with COVID, and you see with that we dropped down to 92, 93. I didn't go into the COVID year of 2019-20 when we were pushed off campus, but I did want to go back one more year just to give you some context. <clears throat> and uh, all of those are through senior release. Uh, so the way the computer works, you would suddenly see our, our attendance drop to the 70s because the, se the seniors are gone. Sure. And they're you know considered non-members and it would drop our attendance. So I stopped at the release of seniors when they graduate and go through their, their activities. Uh, 
In 2021-2022, there was a low of 71.83%. That day was a snow day. The way that it works at Smith is that, and this is how, this is how we, when you look at equity of data, this is a, probably a concern for us. Um, some of our sending districts may cancel school, so out of the hill towns. They will not transport that day. But we, in the valley here in Northampton, may still be able to hold school, which means we could potentially have districts that don't report that day. Uh, so that artificially hurts our attendance because we're actually still in session. Those students are not required to come and there is, in fact, no transportation coming from that district. So they have no way of getting here, uh, especially on a snow day. We'll still take them. Some choose to drive themselves, which is cool, which usually happens with the older, older students. Um, and then you'll see the same thing of the low uh, in 2020-2021. Uh, <clears throat> I can't pinpoint what the low was uh, for 2018-19 because that was like May 5th. So I'll have to go back and do some research on that one. I don't know why we were that low that day. I could guess May 5th that it was senior skip day, but I'd have to go back. <laughs> um, you can see we've had a high of 100% 100, 100 on several days, um, and then that year was 99.39. So you're not seeing attendance in half by the tail end of the pandemic at all? No, it looks like uh, it looks like there was a slight drop in that first year when we were in hybrid, yeah. but we were counting students as present when they logged on. Right. So that would have had an impact on that. Yeah. We did see a dip that that last year when yeah. people were back in full swing, uh, and now we see it obviously moving back up to the ninety-five percent. Yeah. Ideally, we want to be at a hundred, but ninety-five percent or higher is would be deemed an acceptable rate. Uh, <coughs> Thank you. Personnel. All openings have been filled, but I will just touch upon uh, what Dr. Lincoln Hoker mentioned in his report uh, and wanted me to go in a little bit more. Staff orientation, we had 14 new staff members this year. Uh, that's a high number for us. We did have several retirements. We did add new staff, four new staff members, thanks to the board uh, for approving that in the budget. ELA, history, PE, and part-time, we had a half-time school nurse. And then we did have some resignations. Uh, just want to also point out that we are still projecting a mid-year hire for animal science as we expand to the companion animal program for that concentration. New, story, new student orientation took place on Friday, August 26th. That was held in our gymnasium. It did get very hot. Uh, but because of the size of classes that we have now holding in the cafeteria where there is air conditioning, just really not a feasible alternative. Uh, they were on campus for presentations from administrators, from uh, class advisors, school nurse, they toured the campus, met their academic teachers, and then under the direction of Heather Bully, they were all served lunch uh, before leaving at 1230. We had our team building day again because we pull from so many communities, and in, 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 I believe this year we're at 62 <coughs> different cities and towns. Uh, so we do try to, we, we instituted team building day about four or five years ago, uh, and our students go through that as freshmen to try to build and try to get to know each other. So that took place on September 1st. That was under the direction of Jackie Dugan, our health teacher, and was assisted by Louis Bonilla and Nate Bergeron. And any teacher who had ninth grade students uh, went into that and took part. Uh, those were in and out of the gymnasium and outside on the field. As you know, our back, back school day is upcoming, that's six to eight. Some MCAS, we've had preliminary data that's come out, it's, it's embargoed. Um, but I can tell you that we're beginning to run remediation programs for any students that did not meet standards. Uh, and although I can't share out any official data, I will say that preliminary results show that we had a decrease in failures uh, for ELA and math year over year. Science, there really aren't any year over year results since the last exam was 2019. And it was, now we've moved into the next gen science. So different tests, different, um, different uh, benchmarks for passing. Excited. We've been building the advanced placement program now for about six years. <clears throat> um, and a lot of that's under the direction of our curriculum director, Mike Parks, who oversees a lot of this and works with our AP coordinator, uh, who is also our English department head, uh, Holly Moore and Silly. In language composition, which is 11th grade uh, course, we had 19 students take the test. Uh, there were eight scores of two, two scores of three, one score of four. In literature composition, a 12th grade exam, we had 14 tests, seven scores of two, four scores of three, one four, and our first ever perfect five. It was pretty awesome. 
Uh, in statistics, we had nine tests. That's one of, one of our newest APs, only a couple years old. All of our students scored a one, uh, but it's a really great experience for them. Added for the 2022-23 school year, current school, school year, we've added AP U.S. government. Uh, that's another 11th grade, so we have two in 11th, two in 12th. All students are required to take the exam, and we pay for those exams through Title IV funds. Current enrollment in our AP courses, uh, in 11th grade language and composition, there's 14 students. In U.S. government, there's 20. 12th grade uh, literature and composition, we have 11 students taking it, and in statistics, 14. For our professional learning communities, that's where we run and organize our, our year-long PDs that we do. <clears throat> This year we're going to be focused on NEASC, so we're entering our 10-year uh, study, so it, we'll be doing it under the new Vision 2022, which but version 2, so that's been adjusted yet again over the summer. Uh, it will be one of the first cohorts to go through the Vision 2, uh, version 2 of Vision 2020. Uh, what we're going to be doing is between December and February 2024, using those early release days, we'll have the professional learning committees will be set up around 10 committees. There's five standards. We're going to break it up so we have five on the academic side, five on the vocational side, each of them looking at those standards through their lens in one steering committee. Uh, our director of pupil services, um, Rebecca Wanzik, and I will co-chair that steering committee and we'll be joined by an academic teacher, a vocational teacher, our curriculum director, Mike Parks, and our vocational director, Melly Charrier, uh, as that steering committee. And we'll go through some trainings together as a group. Uh, and the way that it works now, in the spring of 2024, we'll have a visit, uh, but that's a smaller visit now. And really what that's focused on is the report that we draft is a report that focuses on uh, growth areas. So we need to take all that information, scale it down to a two to three page paper, manifesto almost, around what are our growth areas, what do we want to target, what do we want to do. And it's not until two years later in 2026 when we actually have that regular decennial visit that we're used to. And now it happens two years in, and really what they're doing is looking at your uh, goals and trying to hold you accountable to what you said you were going to be doing. This week we're having our club fair. Uh, it is this displays in the cafeteria for all students to be able to see and know what opportunities they can have from the clubs and activities. That will also be out at back to school night this Thursday so the parents can have a look at it. Uh, and now we are going to do a little show and tell. So Automotive uh, did get the Capital Skills Grant in the last round. Um, and what, right before we got the culinary. Uh, but they wanted us to highlight some of that's been involved. We were really targeting improvement for electric vehicles and trainers. So I'm going to, Mandy is a senior in automotive. Um, so she's going to help me. So she'll start off and, and talk about this uh, hybrid vehicle trainer, kind of some things that I can go into a little bit more details. Um, this is new this year. Uh, it's, we got it because being in the as the shops, but the shops change with like the world. Um, you know, a lot of electric vehicles are coming to play. I think it's really important for any technicians to get out the world to learn about um, how to work on those kind of cars. And we're gonna have, I think, a few of these. Uh, basically, it shows like inner workings, like a lot of the circuits that's gonna be in the car, um, and because. You know, those cars can be especially dangerous compared to like the regular um, gasoline uh, cars that we work on. So I think it's really a cool tool for that you can do this to Yes, the, the special highlights about this board, believe it or not, this board is $7,000 with the, we talk about how expensive vocational education is, $7,000 with the software and, and what it connects to. What this allows the instructors to do is it allows them, this is, if, if so much of the uh, electrical vehicles is going to be very familiar to our electrical students. So this is a diagram, uh, schematic, of how the electric car system works and how it's all wired in series and where it goes. This allows the instructors through the computer to introduce faults and error codes and other things and they have to go in and find out what is wrong with that vehicle. Um, also, all, and then they can test it. As you can see, it has drive, reverse, neutral, parking brakes, uh, the accelerator, the brake, they can use it to find any faults that are within the system to troubleshoot it and then identify how to fix that, that thing. Um, it's a really, really cool piece of technology um, and it, it allows a lot of flexibility and adaptability. Uh, and then the next one, 
Did you did he give you anything on that one? Um, I don't know if he did. I have the okay. I'll, so this this basically is another very expensive. Looks like just a basic RC car, right? You didn't see people build. The the special thing about this car, again, is it connects through software to the computer system. It allows the students to change the suspension. Uh, it's all ratioed at, to uh, the actual vehicle. Okay, so the specs are the same. It's just shrunk down. They can change the gearing. They can change all the suspensions. They can change the, uh, to ch uh, the, the engines and a lot of the other things to change the torque, to change to how it drives, to ch uh, change how it handles. And then it sends the data back to a computer that is able to give them and they know feedback. what actual feedback on what was changed and what it actually did to the vehicle and how it improved it or did not improve it. So it may look like just a, a little RC car, but they're able to actually build it to those, those specs, change all the inner workings of that car, go ahead out and drive it with a computer recording all of the diagnostic information, and then they're able to go in and they're able to, to look at that and, and see all the variations that exist. So <clears throat> really cool stuff without having to have them build a car and drive it around campus. <laughs> but they're able to get that same thing, so. Uh, and pending your questions, that, that's uh, our report for this evening. Um, what uh, an accomplishment is it is to have um, all openings filled. I just want to call that out. Um, it, it speaks to the culture that you foster here as a school leader. I think, you know, it's a... It's, it's a great place to work, and people want to be here, and it's really remarkable. Um, it is so cool to see all of the academic opportunities that students have, you know, um, through with the, their advanced placement classes. Um, and your embargoed MCAS data uh, is making me think about um, student growth. Do you get SGPs for students? Or you do. Okay, so I would, uh, that if, if possible, at some point, um, when you know, over the next couple of months, I would be really interested in um, knowing a little bit more about those, but also in student growth much more broadly. Um, so with all of the students in all of the grades in academic classes and in their shop classes, how do how do we know um, that students are growing? that they're growing and learning. Um, I, and I'd be really interested in maybe more unorthodox kinds of measures of that. Um, that probably are the orthodox for a vocational school, yeah. but I just imagine that there's a whole array of ways that you and the faculty are looking at that, and I'd love to hear more about it. And I also add your subgroups, mm -hmm. so you know how the Department of Ed is talking about ELL slash LA, because that's also my help with certain grant opportunities when you write your, your grants. You show how that you're um, meeting all the different subgroups, not the problem with the $5 million. Because you break apart, like these are demographics, this is how they connect, so what programs are they in? I think, um, so the only thing around that we would keep in mind is that a lot of the student growth is not connected to a student over the same student year over year. Yeah. So we would be comparing cohorts and, and cohorts right. because right. especially since we're coming from sixty two communities that, that's the and we're not tracking um, definitely that's a curveball. Right. Um, and our and you know the subgroups being we are just for uh, point information, we're about forty two percent special education and sixty four and a half percent high needs school. So Definitely, that's information that, that is important for us to have and highlight when we go for these grants and show that we are able to, um, you know, meet the expectations on the academic side yeah. and vocational side, and right. we're doing it with exactly. uh, some subgroups that take a lot of uh, oh, extra very hard And we also have one for STEAM, so if you look for how money um, grants are for STEAM to so certain populations, it's <coughs> like I'm a former math and science teacher. So that can also help with um, STEAM grants out there, so there might be something out there for that. That's why we need the grant right now. Yes. Working on it. Well, thank you all. Are there any other questions? Mandy, I want to thank you for joining us. And it's exciting to have some of that from the uh, <coughs> department that can actually help Joe explain <laughs> what goes on. No, just kidding. <laughs> yeah, we Thanks, Joe. Experts. Good report. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, let's get into new business here. <coughs> uh, 
We have a vote and a second to approve an out-of-state field trip to Johnson & Wales University in Rhode Island for culinary arts for 10 students, juniors, and seniors on Friday, October 21st, 2022. So, second. second. Thank you. Just as a point of reference, don't mind, there's a Campbell Wise and field trip coming to the board. Uh, so the board policy is any out-of-state field trip or overnight field trip has to go up front of the board. Just, you know. Thank you. <coughs> vote in the second to approve an out-of-state field trip to New York City for criminal justice seniors in April or May of 23. Is that something that is upcoming? So moved. Second. Second. Thank you. Just as a point of discussion. Correct. I, I just want to put it in reference that uh, our criminal justice, one of our instructors, is. Uh, was a first responder uh, to, at 9-11. Uh, this is a trip that the Criminal Justice Department wants to make as a yearly trip. It'll still come in front of you, but I think the plan is, uh, you know, with the knowledge of the board, that they would begin fundraising and have it be a senior trip to the memorial and uh, museum on a, on a yearly basis. Yeah, I know it's near and dear to Thank you, Chair. Uh, vote second to approve the annual updates to the admissions policy. Yeah, both. Yeah. Take your vote. Oh. On both of them. First two. And vote to approve applying for this Kibler Grant contest. Great. So let's go back to Johnson and Wales. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, you don't witness that one? Yeah. yeah. Sorry. All in favor. Vote to approve for now on the state trip to Johnson Wales University of Island for culinary arts Friday, October 21st. We have a motion and a second. We just need all in favor. All in favor? So I think I missed that, Mike. All in favor. Did you give me my red sheet today? I did. It's in there. <laughs> <laughs> all in favor? Yeah. 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 All in favor of the New York City trip. Back to the New York City trip. Yeah, actually. All in favor. So confused. <laughs> okay. Approve an on-state field trip yeah. in New York City for criminal justice seniors in April or May of 2023. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Vote to approve the annual updates to the admission policy. Vote in a second. Did, uh, did I? Did we do a vote? Yes. In the second Julie, Julie Dr. Spencer Robinson, made a motion. Do okay. we need a second? Yep, we need a second. Right. Okay. Director Pearson Campbell. Oh, you do. Perfect. All right. Jumping right All in favor? Can I just do it? Uh, Aye. Just, please. Uh, just as a, a point of reference, we have to review the admissions, the, under the new regulations, we have to review the admissions policy annually. Whether we update it or not, that's up to us. Uh, at the very least, I have to go in and sign off that whether it's the current and existing policy or the new updated policy is meeting all state regulations. What is in front of you this evening, there's only one change. I just want the board this one here. in full, tra yes, in full transparency. The flag, the flag page. You'll see, thank you to Ms. Carver for flagging the page. It's the third piece of paper in red. So basically the context here is uh, non-resident students, state regulation is the, the Deadline to apply through non-resident is March 15th. Uh, what was happening is, and we had stated that in the current application, unfortunately our, our current practice uh, raised a couple red flags with the state to work through them, uh, but we were actually scoring applicants that were coming in after March 15th, and, and that, there was a concern there. Uh, so we wanted to clarify things, make things much more transparent uh, internally and externally. So what you see in red there is, uh, we're not going to throw an application away that comes in after March 15th. We're still going to hold on to it. We're not going to score it. We're going to set it aside. Uh, we would assume we will have a wait list like we have over the last few years. Uh, we will work through the wait list, which would consist of Northampton applicants and non-resident applicants that apply before March 15th, but weren't part of the initial 150 acceptances. <coughs> if and when we work through that entire wait list and we still have openings, we will then go to the post-March 15th applicant pool. We will score them. 
rank them like we would normally do and begin to offer acceptances to that, that group. And continue that process until we, we feel like we come to class. Uh, the only other addition is, okay, that's our non-resident students that come in after March 15th. We hold on to them. The Northampton applications, as they come in, we, we score them in the place accordingly on the potential wait list uh, because there is no official deadline for application for the Northampton students. So that's what you see in front of you in red. I just wanted to give you the context. Uh, the March 15th is not a date that we come up with as a, a state mandate. So. Thanks, Amy. I have a motion to second to approve applying for skills count for oh. missions policy, sorry. So um, we need to go ahead and get a yep, all in favor. All in favor. Aye. Aye. All right. There we go. All right. We have a motion to second approve applying for the skills capital grant that Andy talked about earlier. So moved. Okay. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. May have a motion to second to approve spending $186,597 for access control management system. I'm going to have Amy talking at that top system. Just ask for a motion. Or is it? So moved. Okay, we have a second. 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 So just for the, the board's perspective, and uh, you know, there's been a lot of discussions over the last several years between within the administrative team about school safety and security. Uh, I think we've been working endlessly trying to maintain and improve school security, i.e. all the security cameras that we now have on campus. Uh, we have the uh, school security officer on campus uh, and many other improvements. Uh, as you know, uh, the union uh, did a survey, uh, presented several ideas uh, to the board. Uh, we reviewed those. Um, one item that we have been talking about as an administrative team for the last few years, that was also on that list, uh, is the access control management system, i.e. FOB system. Um, so the challenge that we have here, we are basically a college campus. We have many buildings. How do we totally lock this campus down while we have students traveling from point A to point B? It's next to impossible. But what can we do to improve? So we are looking at a FOB system. I took mine off today, but um, yeah, they have not, obviously. Uh, so we all have our school IDs with our pictures on them. Our students are already using the, uh, the school ID for the lunch line. It's, it's attached to their My School Bucks uh, account. Uh, so they pay for the food. Uh, all of the staff have one. There's already a barcode on there. So we are looking for systems that can be integrated into that current ID system uh, to allow us to get into the various buildings. Uh, the vision is to not create, uh, not install a FOB system on every single entry point. Uh, we will identify the main entry points. Uh, other doors will just keep locked you know, from the outside, obviously, not permanently. Uh, the hope is that such a FOB system we can program uh, by category. So uh, if I'm an instructor who works out of D building, perhaps I have access to D building, but would I necessarily need access to another building? So those are the conversations that we're looking uh, to answer. Maybe there's times of the day uh, that my FOB will work for certain time, times of the day, it won't work for other times of the day. Uh, so that's the vision, is to install this FOB system. Uh, right now, I, I think Mr. Shear is here to answer any questions. If you have any, yes, please do. Uh, but he's been, he's been sort of the point person in, in researching the systems. Uh, right now, the one quote we have, that's why we have a, a number in front of you. Ideally, we can find something less expensive. My only other addition, if it has to be a, an amendment to the motion, I just want to be, again, totally transparent. Where is that money coming from? I would advocate it comes out of tuition involvement. So. Okay. <coughs> Josh, anything you want to add? I think he uh, <coughs> yeah. summed it up pretty well. Please. I, I just wanted to add a historical context. We looked at a system about eight years ago, and we were quoted $750,000. So technology has changed, and I think what, what's capable, and Josh has done a lot of research uh, at looking at that to find a, a more flexible and affordable options for us. I, I think it's wonderful that this is happening because that's a pretty quick turnaround. I mean, I know you've been looking at this for a while, but also to make it happen, you know, when just in light of the recent school shootings, there's just, a, I think, a greater sense of urgency to it and, and dealing with the complications in, involved in this. Um, and I would be curious, because we did hear from the 
union about, I think they had, they had a lot of recommendations, if I'm remembering right, in that. Yeah, I showed this yeah. to them when they're very happy. Yeah, so awesome. Happy. So I'd be maybe curious to see how they feel, if they, and students as well, um, if everyone feels safer in the, in the building, in all, on campus after this, and we sort of gather the information as we can. Thank you. Any further discussion? If not, all in favor? Aye. Aye. We're going to provide that next motion. The mayor's not here. And there's some, something that she wants to talk about, so we're going to go by it. Uh, may I have a motion and a second to approve the following? I'm going to read them all off. FY22 invoices. Collaborative for Educational Services, $55. Mansfield paper for $514.38 out of cafeteria revolving. In Orchard Electric, electric $2,266.65 out of tuition recovery. They have a motion. So moved. All in favor? Aye. We have a motion and a second to approve the following surplus items for resale. From the admin, six cooler lunch bags and 23 water bottles for student government fundraiser. From graphics, a fiery color controller E5300 and an AV dip press for the copyright way. From culinary arts, 18 inch natural gas char grill. So moved. Second. second. All in favor? Aye. Thank you. May I have a motion and a second to approve the following surplus for scrap? From graphics, a 27-inch CRT television, AB Dick single color press, two Epson P9000 wide format printers, Thermotype BCS plus slitter, AB Dick 910 9810 with power unit, Rico mm -hmm. Fessio MP6001 bomb 2020, polar. Cutter model 76 EM hydraulic paper, paper cutter. What a brand some models. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Nice job. We have a motion. Motion to move. So move. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We did it, kids. Woo! <laughs> okay, future business. October 18th, 2022, regular Board of Trustees meeting here at 5 o'clock in the library. <coughs> November 15th. 2022 regular board of trustees meeting here in the library. Upcoming events, we have October 12th, 2022 program advisory committee's fall meeting at 6 p.m. cafeteria and shops. We'd love to have you come. We'll have a great meal. And now I will ask you. Well, that's right. Meeting adjourned. <laughs> <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm Usually, I will say that we I try to be out of here by six. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like you. I like you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Can you share no, that? No, I know what you're Can you share that policy electronically? Because <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if Andy does it or if Rebecca substitutes. Uh, oh. We're going to have the open one. 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 And Lauren would need it just so that she has it. Yeah, or even a custom that you're just updating it in the drive, and you just share it with me. I don't know how you do that. It's separate. So are you going to be with me? Right now, well, I was going to say, if you send a bus after. <laughs> 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 I'd like to do that. It is a separate system. Mental health. Yeah, it's very intense. Yeah. My son lives down in Mount Poison. Oh, is that right? Oh, Rochester. Oh, sure, yeah, yeah. 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 He's the prosecutor with the Bristol County DA's office. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. All right, thank you. I love your time. Yeah, what kind of rule? Yes, we're. That I was very. I don't know which one is more cool. Yeah.
Senator Colson. Yeah, is there a restroom around the corner? Yes. Go so out, take a right, and then take the third door on your left. I'll see you at the next meeting. Thank you. Have a good day now. Very nice. Bye-bye. Nice to see you. Yes. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good night. All right. Um,